This is chapter 13. It deals with the characterization and classification now of viruses, viroids, and prions. Viruses, so what are they? They are, number one, extremely small. They're the smallest of any of the microscopic uh, organisms that we have dealt with yet. They are acellular. They are infectious. They have either DNA or RNA, but they will never have both. They have one or the other. They can cause disease infections, so they are path some of them are pathogens on humans. They can cause disease infections in plants, in other animals, and actually also in bacteria. Um, so as I said, they do cause several different diseases. They cannot carry out typically various metabolic uh, reactions and pathways on their own because what they do is when they infect a cell, they tend to either do one of two things, lay dormant, or they take over the machinery of the cell that they have infected. Um, it's it's kind of like, think of taking uh, over a company, a merger. You're going to come in. And are you going to do all the work? No, you're going to let them do the work for you. They don't necessarily respond or grow in response to the environment. They do not have uh, a cytoplasmic membrane. They don't have organelles to them. They're very, very simple. Basically, they have two components. They have the nucleic acid, like I said, either the DNA or RNA. And then they will have a coat or a capsid that surrounds it to protect it. There is still kind of a debate or argument, however you want to word it, amongst uh, biologists and even amongst microbiologists as to whether or not you would classify them as living. And part of that has to do with the reproduction. As you see here, it says it cannot reproduce independently. That is true. Can they reproduce? Yes, they can. And they do. Can they do it by themselves? No, they cannot. They are dependent upon a host cell in order to reproduce. And part of that has to do with the fact that they can't carry out metabolic processes on their own. Uh, they cannot reproduce their DNA or reproduce their RNA by themselves. So they, they need a host cell. And that's where some people will say, well, they're not living because they can't reproduce by themselves. Others will say, yes, they are living because they can reproduce, which is one of the properties or characteristics of a living thing. All it says is that it can reproduce. doesn't say whether it can do it by themselves or not. So these two groups still argue back and forth. The extracellular state or version of the virus is often called a virion. As I said, you've got this coat or this capsid that surrounds and protects that nucleic acid. It's made up of protein. Um, some viruses, and it just depends on which type of virus you're specifically talking about, some will, in addition to have the capsid, will also have an envelope around it. That outermost layer does help provide another layer of protection. And it's also a recognition site for a lot of the host cells. The intracellular state, that capsid, is removed, and the virus is simply the nucleic acid. So this is a picture um, showing a schematic diagram and then an actual transmission electron micrograph of a virus where you've got the capsid. Like I said, each one of those little tiny uh, round circles of the capsid that makes it up is typically a protein. And then inside is where you have your nucleic acid. In terms of the genetic material, like I said, when you go to classify viruses, you look at that genetic material. It is either DNA or it is RNA, but it is never both. So the first thing for classification is you look at, well, what kind of nucleic acid is it? If it's DNA, put it in one category. If it's RNA, it goes in the other category. Then you're going to look at what is the form of that DNA. Is it Single-stranded or is it double-stranded? Now, I know most of you have always heard DNA is always double-stranded, but there are some viruses that are single-stranded DNA. 
And then you would do the same thing with RNA. You would divide or separate them out. Is it double-stranded RNA or is it single-stranded RNA? And once again, I know most of you have probably always been told, well, RNA is always single-stranded. Well, there are some viruses that contain double-stranded RNA. Keep in mind, a virus is going to do what it wants. It never read your book. It doesn't care what a biology book says. It's going to do what it wants. What is that nucleic acid like in terms of is it linear? Is it circular? Well, it depends on what virus you're talking about. So in this picture, it is showing actually uh, down at the bottom. Here is an E. coli that ruptured. And all, most of these strands are the DNA of the E. coli that basically is leaking out of the cell. And way up here at the top, this is a viral uh, genome. As you can see, it's a circular little piece of DNA. That would be a virus. <coughs> most viruses will only infect a particular specific type of host cell. So it's not just, oh, I'll infect whatever cell is closest. There are certain receptors on both the host cell and on the virus that have to be compatible with each other. It's Think of it this way, that the virus has to be able to come in and it has to match up with a docking station on the surface of the host cell. If that docking station is not there, if that receptor is not there, then the virus cannot attach to that particular cell, and it's going to move on until it finds one that has the appropriate receptor. This makes it very specific. Um, some viruses are a little bit more general in the number of host cells they can infect, and some are very, very specific. Um, as an example, the influenza virus, it is going to have receptors that are specific for the, the cells, say, in your respiratory system. So that if you inhale it, yes, you're going to get sick, you'll end up with the flu. If you had the influenza virus come in contact on your skin, let's say on your shoulder, is it going to cause an infection on your shoulder? No. Why not? Because there would not be any receptors on those cells of the integumentary system on the skin that would allow it to attach. So it's just going to move on. So they're very specific as to what type of host cell the virus can attach to and then infect. And that has to do with receptors on the the surface of the host cell, and it has to do with certain properties of the virus itself. And this also explains one reason why, just uh, kind of as an aside, just for your own information, why, say, there are a lot of viruses that will infect plants, but why they're not going to do anything to humans. The cells are totally different, and so the receptors are different, so it's not going to infect you at all. There are different types of viruses, so there's different types of pathogenic diseases caused by those pathogenic viruses, and depending on what the host is. In picture A, you can see that there is a plant that has been infected with a virus, and it is causing that loss of the pigmentation that's going to reduce the amount of photosynthesis, which means reduces the amount of growth, and all of that's going to be detrimental to the farmer. In picture B, here you can see all of these little structures surrounding this bacteria. All these are viruses that are attached to them. And then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, down here you can see there are viruses in that histology slide as well on human. What is the size of the selected variants, the selected viruses? This is giving you a little bit of a reference point. Here is the red blood cell. This would be E. coli. 
as you know that is a bacteria. Down here would be viruses. If you enlarge so you can see the E. coli well, now here are the viruses here. So can you see a virus with uh, a regular light microscope? No, you cannot. The only way you're going to see them is using an electron microscope. They're much too small to be seen under a light microscope. So what is the shape or the morphology of these capsids that are helping to protect the nucleic acids? Um, they can come in multiple different shapes and sizes. As I've been mentioning, they help to protect that nucleic acid. They may help attach the virus to the host cell. They are composed of protein, and these little subunits made of protein are called capsomeres. The shape of the viruses, um, there's three basic shapes that they fall into, helical, polyhedral, and complex. So you see some examples of them. Here's a complex one. This is a very well-studied uh, Virus, a bacteriophage, phage means virus, so this is a particularly a virus that ha will infect a bacteria. There are several different groups within this, we call them a T2, a T4, a T6, etc. And all of them will infect bacteria. <coughs> Excuse me. This has been a very well studied one. You can see um, it gets its name called uh, complex because it's that capsid is going to be protecting at the top um, inside right here. Inside here is where that uh, nucleic acid is going to be. And so that head is protecting it. Then the tail portion with these little tail fibers. This is what's going to help attach it to the host cell. Just so you know, this particular virus, like I say, has been very well studied. We know the entire genome of it. We know every, um, basically everything about it. We know how it will attach to the host cell. In this tail portion here, we know all the proteins, what order they're made in, how it's assembled. And so this is, like I say, a very well studied one. But it, it shows you the complex nature or shape of it. Kind of looks like a spacecraft. The viral envelope, this can be acquired from the host cell when um, the virus is being released. It Basically, the viral envelope is essentially part of the cell membrane from the host cell. So it's got that phospholipid bilayer. It's got proteins. Um, and oftentimes when there's an envelope, you get these little spikes on it as well. Envelope viruses tend to be more fragile than a naked virus by itself. So here is an example of an enveloped uh, virus. So inside you have your viral DNA, then you have this helical capsid right here, and then this is the envelope that is surrounding it. Like I said, this was formed from the host cell uh, plasma membrane or cell membrane. And then sometimes you end up with these glycoproteins which extend out and look like little spikes. So this table just shows some of the different novel properties of viruses. You obviously, um, because they're novel, you haven't seen them before associated with bacteria or fungi. So it just gives you a comparison between viruses and cells. So how do we classify viruses? Well, number one, type of nucleic acid. Is there an envelope present? What is the shape and what is the size? You'll notice as we go through and look at viruses that the classification scheme of them um, is a little different than, say, bacteria and viruses and even plants and animals. And that for classification purposes, they've only been organized into families. So you don't have genus and species like you do, say, for the bacteria. So this is showing the, the DNA viruses, um, the different families, such as the Poxviridae, 
herpes viridae. And over here, it's giving you the different types of viruses that we have found in there, and in parentheses, the diseases that they cause, and here, whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded. And then your RNA viruses, we have the same type thing. Some examples of um, Calicinae viridiae is a single-stranded RNA virus. It does uh, contain the norovirus is in this family that is a causative agent of gastroenteritis. Um, basically, you're going to end up with it's a polite way of saying severe intestinal distress. You're going to end up with severe diarrhea. Norovirus is something that unfortunately has often been associated with like cruise ships. Uh, people in a confined area, when there's an outbreak, it tends to spread very rapidly. So how do viruses replicate? Well, they are dependent on the, the host cell in order to carry out the replication process. There's uh, different ways they can do this. The main one we see is what we call the lytic replication. This is when the virus is going to infect the host cell. It will immediately take over the host cell and start the replication process for the virus. Doesn't care about the cell anymore. So it's taking over and basically you're going to do what I want and you're going to make more virus particles for me. There's five different stages of this lytic replication cycle, attachment, entry, synthesis, assembly, and then release. So the virus, as we look at this, what's going to happen, uh, and this is showing with one of the, the T bacteriophages infecting a bacterium as the example. First stage is attachment. It's going to recognize certain receptor stage, uh, sites on the membrane. So remember, it has to be compatible between the virus and the membrane. So you have this virus coming along. Oh, it, it's able to attach to the receptor. If the receptor was not here, the virus would just continue, just continue on its merry way. It wouldn't be able to bind. So that's where you get the specificity. So it attaches. Once it has attached, now in this case, like I was saying previously, we've studied this virus extensively. So we know that what happens is that this tail section right here on the very bottom, it has these little pokes, which it will attach to the cell membrane. And then it will condense down. So it's like it's uh, squashing down, forms basically this pore through here. And the, right here is the viral. DNA and it is passing from the inside the capsid into the cell. So now this would be inside the bacterial cell. So now it's in. This whole complex, now this empty capsid and the tail sheets, they remain attached on the outside of the, the bacteria. So now that phage DNA, that's the viral DNA, it is inside the cell. What does it do? Synthesis is when it's taking over. The, the cell and it starts the whole process of DNA replication, not of the bacteria DNA, but of the viral DNA. And in addition to that, it's also making all the proteins necessary for making that capsid. Remember the capsid, the tail, the sheath, the tail fibers, all the components that are protecting and surrounding the virus, all of this up here is made out of protein. Well, it's going to force the cell essentially to make those protein components. So synthesis is it's immediately taking over the host cell. And the whole purpose is replicating the virus. You're replicating the viral nucleic acid. You're replicating the viral proteins that are needed for some. And then here, basically, assembly is setting up like an assembly line. You have all these components, and what are you going to do? You start to piece them together. You have a base plate. You stick the tail to it. Now you put the sheath on it. Oh, now you've got the DNA uh, made. You put that inside the capsule. So now you attach the tail to this capsule. Oh, now let's see. Put those tail fibers on, and now you're done. Once you are done assembling, then it is going to be the new these essentially new viruses, they are going to be released from that host cell.
How are they released? Usually the cell is lysed. So the lytic replication cycle, it will the virus will infect the host cell and immediately start viral replication at the expense of the host cell. Once it's kind of like once you made all these copies for me, I don't need you anymore. And what happens to each one of these new viral particles that is released, it now will go and infect new cells. How long does this take? This is showing in minutes that you have attachment of the virus. Roughly five minutes is what it takes for that virus to enter into the cell. In the next 20 minutes, it's going to synthesize and assemble new viruses in there. So 25 minutes after it first attached to the cell is when the new viral particles are being released. And each one of those is going to go and infect a new cell. So just think about that for a second. This might help explain why you might be feeling perfectly fine. And you go to work, you go to wherever you're, you're going, and you're feeling fine in the morning. And let's say you're exposed to somebody that has a virus, whether it's influenza virus or whatever. Um, right now with this going through the COVID-19, maybe it is the coronavirus. You're exposed to it. Even if it's just one virus, you're exposed to it. It enters your cell. And 25 minutes later, it could be. Now, the time chain is different for every virus. So this is just giving as an example. Some of them are this short. Some might take a little bit longer. But in 25 minutes, you're releasing new viruses. How many new virus particles are made? Once again, it depends on the virus you're talking about. It can be anywhere from 50 to 200. So let's just say in 25 minutes, let's just say it's released 100 new viruses. What happens to each one of those 100? They each go infect a new cell. And 25 minutes later, they're each releasing 100. And maybe now this helps to explain to you why, yes, when you went out in the morning, you felt perfectly fine. But maybe 12 hours later or 24 hours later, you start going, you know, I kind of have the sniffles. Or I don't really feel that great. The incubation time for influenza virus is 24 hours. So that means... It is 24 hours from when you were first exposed to when you can start showing symptoms of the infection. Now, not everybody's going to show symptoms because for some people, their immune system starts kicking in and fighting and you may never show symptoms. And that's the problem that we are having. Um, you have that, that with any disease that you have these asymptomatic carriers. And that's part of the problem that we are having with the coronavirus is that the incubation time for influenza is 24 hours. The incubation time for coronavirus is 14 days. So you could be exposed and you may not show any symptoms for 14 days. That's a very long time period. And that's why they have tried to do the self-isolation and quarantining if you thought you were potentially exposed is in that 14 day period, you may not be showing symptoms, but you may be contagious, which means you could be infecting other people. This time period, of, like I said, how long it takes for that virus to go through this lytic cycle, it will vary depending on which virus you were talking about. Now, the lysogenic replication of uh, bacteriophages, this is a little bit different than the lytic stage. There's some what we call modifications. What happens here is the virus doesn't replicate right in, away. It still infects the cell, <coughs> Excuse me, but it does not start the replication process immediately. Sometimes we use these different terms like prophages, which are inactive phages. 
Uh, this has been studied with a different type of phage known as lambda. It is still a bacteriophage, meaning that it does infect bacteria. So here's what happens with the lysogenic phase. You still have your virus up here in our upper left. First stage is going to be attachment. So here's your bacteria because it's a bacteriophage. So here's your bacteria, and here's the lambda phage. Here's the virus that comes in and it attaches. Once again, if there's not a receptor site, it will just move on its merry way. Receptor site is there, so it attaches to it. Now it's able, step two, to enter the host cell. Right here is the proverbial fork in the road. Do you go right or do you go left? Which do you do? Because you got two choices here. Which way it goes, which process it goes. If it goes this way, it's going to go into the, the lytic cycle that we just talked about, where you're going to have replication, assembly, and then release at the expense of that host cell. Here, if it goes this way, is where it can go into the lysogenic state or cycle, whichever you wish to call it. Which way it goes will be dependent on environmental conditions. What's occurring right now in that particular environment that that cell and that virus are in? It may be different 20 minutes from now. It may be different tomorrow. It may be very different than what it was yesterday. It's what's occurring right now. If it goes into the lysogenic cycle, then it will move along here across the top. So now you're DNA, viral DNA is in here, in that bacteria, in that host. What does it do? It becomes incorporated into the host cell DNA. And that's what we call a prophage. It's literally incorporated into that host cell DNA now. So guess what happens now every time the cell now gets ready to go through its cell division? Is it going to read just its own DNA and say, oh, stop here, that's a viral DNA? No, it does not. When it goes through DNA replication, it copies the entire strand of DNA, including that virus that has incorporated itself into it. Think about it. That's pretty smart on the part of the virus. It doesn't have to do any work at all. It's letting the bacteria replicate the viral DNA as it replicates its own bacterial DNA. <laughs> Sit back and let you do all the work. Here's another interesting thing. That cell after DNA replication, the cell goes through binary fission and now you have two bacteria. Each one has a copy of the viral DNA incorporated into the bacterial DNA. And when each one of those two cells goes through replication, it's resulting cells are always going to have the viral DNA in it. Pretty nifty way of getting copies of yourself. You never had to leave the host cell, which never put you in danger of being recognized by the, say, any type of immune system, because there's a, a fashion of this that occurs in animals. You're not exposed to the external environment. You're not having to expend any energy. You're letting the host cell do everything for you, but yet you're increasing your numbers because every new daughter cell has that viral DNA in it. And at any point in time, once again, it can be triggered by environmental conditions. At any point in time, you can go, wait a minute, hmm, I'm kind of done with this. And you cut yourself out of the host cell DNA, and then you flip into the lytic cycle. So you cut yourself out, you start doing viral DNA replication now, take over an assembly, and then release. So animal viruses are going to replicate in a very similar fashion. Uh, there are a few differences because 
they do have oftentimes the envelope around some of them. <coughs> Attachment of the animal viruses. Like I said, there has to be a receptor on the host cell. And there is an attraction between the viral protein and this receptor. Um, there are oftentimes those spikes, if you remember, that are on the envelope. The spikes, if they are present, they also help to attach the virus to the host cell. Why would the host cell want it attached? It doesn't, but the virus does because that will help enable it to be taken into the host cell. So here it shows a capsule or capsid with the, the virus in it. And you can see how it becomes attracted to these receptor sites, as I've been saying, on the cell membrane. And then it injects um, the DNA or the RNA into the host cell. So that'd be direct penetration. You can have where it kind of just fuses with the membrane. And that's often when you have the um, spikes, those glycoproteins that kind of help fuse it, hold it in place. And then endocytosis, where you take the whole entire um, virus in, including that membrane. So the way the replication occurs of animal viruses, there's going to be some differences depending on whether you're talking about DNA viruses or RNA viruses. Uh, certainly for animals, DNA viruses, they're often going to have to replicate inside the nucleus. RNA viruses, they can replicate in the cytoplasm. So with double-stranded DNA viruses, the replication is very similar to what we've already seen with DNA replication. <coughs> now, there are a few exceptions because once again, viruses don't like playing by the rules. Hepatitis B virus um, is a DNA virus, but there's going to be a middle step, an intermediate step in there, <coughs> where it's going to use RNA. Single-stranded DNA viruses, their replication is a little bit different because your cells, animal cells, aren't used to seeing single strand of DNA. They're kind of like, what do we do with this? And so they're used to only seeing double stranded. So when you have a single strand of DNA, what's going to happen is the DNA strand kind of forms back on itself, appearing as though it's double stranded. And then ultimately it's released as a single stranded. With RNA viruses, we refer to the RNA strand as either positive or negative. <coughs> Excuse me. Meaning, is it a positive sense or negative sense? The positive, think of it as kind of like mRNA, because that's how it's going to act. Excuse me. <coughs> the negative sense cannot be um, transmitted directly. And so there's going to have to be an extra step in there. So there's four types of RNA viruses. There's a single strand positive sense. There's retroviruses, negative single stranded, and then there's actually double stranded RNA. So just in general, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. <coughs> Excuse me. With a positive uh, Single-stranded RNA viruses, like I say, it can be used uh, similar to like mRNA. So you can have translation occurring off of it for the proteins that are needed, just like you would regularly see translation occur. Now, what's going to happen in terms of making copies of it, not of the protein, but of the single-stranded RNA itself, you're going to use this initial positive single strand as a template, and you're going to make the complementary negative single strand. And then from that, you're going to have use this to have uh, basically transcription occur. Use this as a template to make now more positive RNA. So now this, what you just made, should match what initially entered the cell. It's 
kind of a similar type thing with a negative sense in that you're, you're going to use that initial original negative single-stranded RNA. Remember, you cannot use this for translation. It won't make any sense. And so you can use it as a template to make a positive strand. You can only carry out translation from a positive single-stranded RNA. So from this negative, which you can't use, you're going to, you can use it as a template. Now you just made a single-stranded positive RNA. So now from this, carry out translation, make the proteins you need to make, and then use this also as a template to make more negative strands, which is what you're going to package in for this particular virus. Double-stranded RNA is going to unwind so that you have both the negative and the positive strand. The positive strand is going to be used for making your viral proteins. And then both of these now single strand, because you unwound it here, are going to be used as templates to make more strands that are then going to wind together and then you assemble. So there's just some extra steps in there. <coughs> Retroviruses, they will not use their genome as mRNA. They're kind of in a unique little group. They're going to use DNA as an intermediate. Um, basically what they do is they use their original RNA as a template to make DNA. Then they, because they have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which can use RNA as a template to make your DNA, now you're going to use your DNA to make the RNA that you needed. So this uh, shows in this table the different things that you have as far as double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, and then your RNA, single-stranded and double-stranded, and the different um, characteristics with it. In terms of assembly and then release of your animal viruses, most of your DNA viruses, they're made in the, the nucleic acid is made in the nucleus, they're going to be assembled there. Most of your RNA viruses are going to remain solely in the cytoplasm. <laughs> like I said, how many viruses are you going to produce each time it infects a new cell? Well, that depends, once again, on the, the specific type of virus that you had. It's also going to depend on the health of the host cell. Typically, your envelope viruses can cause persistent infections. Uh, naked viruses that tend to be released by exocytosis or lysis. So as you can see here, here's a process where you <clears throat> have the glycoproteins that are on the surface of the cell. Here's your uh, capsid with the viral uh, nucleic acid, maybe DNA in here, or double-stranded RNA. It's going to move towards the outer surface towards that cytoplasmic membrane, and now it starts to be pushed out, and the membrane of the host cell, see how it wraps around? And that's what's forming the envelope of the virus. Once again, um, typically what you have, <coughs> excuse me, certain amount of time, detachment, and then entry, synthesis, and assembly, and then the release of those new viruses. Some animal viruses, they can infect their host cell, and then they can remain dormant. Once again, similar to what we saw with the lambda virus that infected the bacteria is for lysogenic stage. This is very similar to that. It goes dormant or remains latent. So we can call those typically in microbiology, specifically in the field of studying viruses or virology, they are referred to as latent viruses or proviruses. A provirus is a virus that has incorporated itself into the DNA of an animal cell. How long can it lay dormant there? As long as it wants to. Uh, there have been cases we know where it may lay there for years. It may never pull out from there. Um, so <coughs> an example of this latency, 
and some of you may or may not be aware of this, chicken pox is caused by a virus. When you get the chicken pox, and now there's a vaccine against to protect against chicken pox, but when you used to get it naturally, what would happen is, yes, you had the chicken pox and you suffered through that and then finally you recovered, but you never really got rid of the virus. It could go latent and just kind of hang out. And what would happen is it may never reappear and you're fine. But it could reappear later in life. And sometimes we're talking 30, 40 years later. All of a sudden, somebody starts developing a really severe skin rash, and they're trying to figure out what is this, and it's painful, and then they'd be diagnosed with shingles. What happens is that virus has been dormant. The chickenpox virus, when it lays dormant, and often there are some modifications that happen, and it can reappear later as shingles. For some people, this never happens, but for others, it will. Stress tends to be a, a trigger, but we don't know exactly how and why. And the other thing, it used to be, it seemed like shingles, we typically saw only in older people, and it seems now we're getting younger and younger people developing shingles. The other thing we do not know is whether or not the chickenpox vaccine may actually help you against shingles. We don't know. The chickenpox vaccine is relatively new as compared to some of the other um, vaccines, and so we don't know long term. There is a shingles vaccine as well, which is recommended for people once you reach a certain age. <coughs> but I'm just saying that's an example of a virus that remains, can go latent and remain latent. This is a chart is a, or table is a comparison of the bacteriophages versus the animal virus replication processes. Cell division uh, is under very, very strict genetic control. It's regulated very, very closely. Some cells, once they're formed, can no longer divide at all. Some are very, very closely regulate. You don't want just uncontrolled cell division. That leads to tumors and leads to cancer. So the regulatory genes are very important for determining the rate of cell division. Um, there are times when there can be certain triggers that turn off some of these regulatory genes that are helping to control the rate of cell growth. And what we're finding now is that sometimes it's viruses that can interfere with these regulatory genes. Once again, if the regulatory genes are turned off and you have uncontrolled cell division occurring, then you end up with that mass of cells, which is a tumor, which can be either benign or malignant. Malignant tumors, what we usually refer to them as cancer. And if those tumors spread, if some of the cells break off and spread to another location, that is what we refer to as metastasis. Some of the cancer has metastasized. So there are some uh, genes that we know will promote cell growth and division. And we know that there are certain things that can activate some of these oncogenes or cancer genes. Uh, certain chemicals, radiation, UV light, and like I said, viruses we are finding out can interfere with this. So this is just showing um, examples of, they don't know exactly how it works. If it did, we can try to stop it. That is the thing we're, we're trying to figure out. Is that you can have, as you can see in the middle picture, here's on the upper portion, is the normal DNA. Now here's the, the DNA where we have a virus that is now affecting this oncogene. It's usually not one hit. It has to be multiple things in order for you to see the development of cancer. And so now you've taken another hit over here. <coughs> this eventually may end up with cancer down here.
just one slight mutation, one hit, no, typically you're not going to end up with the cancer. It has, it has to be multiple hits, which is one reason why um, it's over your lifespan, which is why you have a higher risk of developing cancer the, the longer you live. You have better chance of having those hits occur. It has been estimated the virus is cause anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of human cancers. Um, they are trying, like I said, to figure out how can we uh, prevent the viruses from you know, causing the cancer. How can you prevent someone from even becoming infected then with these uh, oncogenic viruses, these cancer-causing viruses? It's a very active area of research. Some uh, viruses that are known to cause human cancers, things like Burkitt's lymphoma, Hodgkin's, uh, cervical cancer, are just some examples. How do you grow viruses? How do you culture them in the lab? You can't grow them in a petri dish just by itself like you do for bacteria because they need a host cell in order to replicate. So there's three main ways of culturing or growing viruses. Number one, using media containing mature organisms, embryonated eggs, or cell cultures. Growing the viruses and bacteria is a very common way of growing them. You can grow the phosphorus and bacteria in a liquid culture or on an auger plate, either way. The bacteria, when they are grown on an auger plate in a petri dish, you have the media, you have the bacteria mixed in there, so they're growing really well, and then you also mix in the viruses. Well, if the viruses are growing and they end up killing the bacteria, they form what we call plaques. And then you can count the number of plaques on an individual petri dish to get an idea of the concentration of viruses. How many numbers are you talking about? <coughs> so on this plate, you have a lawn where you have complete, this is just solid bacterial growth in here. So you refer to that as your lawn. So you would have your media, you inoculate it uh, with the bacteria. And then you also at the same time would have inoculated with the virus. These are the plaques, these little clearing circles here. So you know how typically for bacteria on a petri dish you count the number of colonies to determine the concentration of bacteria? Well for viruses you count the number of plaques. And the idea is each one of these plaques would have represented an individual original virus. So typically you're doing dilutions and you, you're able to calculate how many viruses per milliliter of your solution did you have. Oftentimes they've used plants and other animals to try to culture viruses. Using laboratory animals can be a little difficult and also very expensive. There's a lot of laws as to regulating uh, how you are going to maintain those animals, how you're going to, like if they're, usually they're caged, you have to have so much space for them to be humane. There's, there's ethical questions dealing with this. So most people, there's a lot of federal red tape if you're going to use laboratory animals. And so most people, if they can, they try to stay away from that. Eggs is the way you can culture a lot of viruses in. You use embryonated chicken eggs. It's very inexpensive. An egg is a cell, and so it's one of the largest of the cells, and it's sterile on the inside, so you don't have to worry about contamination. The yolk is very nourishing for a virus. So usually you will use fertilized chicken eggs. It's a very high nutrient um, environment for the virus to grow. So we actually, for a lot of vaccines for, uh, against virus infections, we grow the virus in eggs as part of the prep. That is one of the reasons why, before you get a vaccine, they will often ask you if you are allergic to eggs. And if you've ever wondered, why are you asking me this? I just want to get my vaccine. The reason why they're asking you if you're allergic to eggs is because the vaccine and the preparation process, the virus may have been grown, grown in eggs. And there could be some carryover and they don't want you to have an allergic reaction. 
So there's different areas on the egg where you would inject. And it just depends on which virus you're talking about, whether you're going to inject into the yolk, whether you inject into the membrane. And I had a lab where we had to do this with influenza virus, which was very interesting. I'll just say you're talking about fertilized or embryonated eggs. They're raw eggs. Um, and you have to, what we had to do was wipe down on the egg on the area where we knew we were injecting into the yolk. So first we had to candle the egg. We had to hold the egg up to a light to figure out where the embryo was because we didn't want to hit that. And then we had to go opposite that, take an alcohol swab, wipe off the surface of the egg, and then with your needle gently tap. And that's where it gets a little tricky very gently tap so you can insert your needle but not totally break the egg. We'll just say it takes a bit of practice. Some viruses are cultured in what we call a tissue culture or cell culture line uh, where you are able to grow cells in a medium or in a broth um, and then the, the, back, the viruses are able to infect those cells and, and you grow them in there. This is used for what we call diploid cell cultures or continuous cell culture. So this is where you have cells in here and you're able to inject the virus in. It's able to grow in here and then you can withdraw from it a sample. So once again, one of the big questions is, um, are viruses alive or not? Um, they seem to have evolved from some aspect over time. They are not able to replicate by themselves. They do need a host cell. They can take over a host cell. They seem to be very adept at that. So there's arguments supporting on both sides. So we're going to spend the last little bit discussing some other things. Viroids, these are very small little circular pieces of single-stranded RNA that are infectious. Now these are pathogenic to plants, so obviously are concerned to uh, agriculture. They are not pathogenic to humans, so you're not going to have to deal with it in the health career fields. They're very similar to RNA virus, but they do not have that capsid around them. So this is showing an example of potato spindle tuber virion, which causes very uh, reduced size of your potatoes in that particular case. Prions. Prions have been in the news more recently, and I say more recently in the past, say, 15 years or so, trying to figure out what is this, what are they. Basically, they're proteins that are infectious. Uh, and some of these are pathogenic, shows a uh, three-dimensional form of a particular prion, and that it can be easily made in the cell and one of the disease there are several diseases that can be caused by them uh, one of them is often referred to as a wasting disease here is what normal brain tissue would look like notice how dense it is spongiform <coughs> uh, the brain <coughs> excuse me this wasting disease notice it gets its name spongiform because you have all these open cavities it's destroying the cells in the brain. So we have been able to identify different diseases that are caused by various prions. They seem to be transmitted by ingesting or transplanting or contact with infected tissues. We do not have at this particular time any standard treatment for Unfortunately, it seems as though some of the normal sterilization procedures also do not seem to deactivate these prions. They are destroyed by autoclaving if you put them in concentrated sodium hydroxide or by incineration. So this is showing some of the various human diseases as well as some of the animal diseases that are caused by prions. Um, and as I said, this is a, 
a huge area of research right now and trying to find a way of treating and prevention of this. So this table is showing comparison of your bacteria to viruses to virus and prions. Once again, in terms of looking at diseases caused by viruses, this will be handled or discussed in a later chapter. This particular chapter is just looking at all these uh, properties, characteristics, etc., of viruses in general. One thing I do want to say, we often teach this towards those going into the healthcare field, and so most people think of viruses, as well as bacteria and fungi, as pathogenic. Oh, they're out to kill me. Just keep in mind that there are a lot of viruses out there that are not pathogenic, and just to give you an idea, um, if you have ever seen uh, tulips that have kind of a red and yellow striping pattern combination to them, that was initially seen due to an infection of a virus that caused that, that kind of striping pattern, that marbled pattern. So not all viruses are bad. Some of them are going to be good, so just keep that in mind.